Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune. And there is a lot going on in the world of OU recruiting, spring ball, basketball portal. There's buzz that we can't really talk about just yet on portal. Uh, potential players around the country getting in the portal. Um Maybe Oklahoma will go after him. Maybe they won't. Um, we'll see, but that will be later on in April, whenever we can start really diving into that topic of discussion. But there's enough to talk about right now. You've got softball on the way and just rocking and rolling as usual. Baseball, been a little up and down the past week. They're still ranked, I think, 21st in the country right now. Uh, Skip Johnson and country uh, and, and company have got that thing going pretty well so far in the 2024 season. And then obviously spring football and portal basketball talk. Uh, we're going to try to talk about as much as we can on that, particularly recruiting spring football and portal basketball. And we're going to talk a little bit Porter Moser. Should I stay or should I go? Something like that. I think after everything that's happened this weekend with Javion McCullough, column and uh, uh, your four starting <laughs> players are gone. Plus, you know, doesn't hurt that a couple of the seniors are gone too. So, all right, Parker, before we do all that, you've got a ad you want to read, right? Yes, we got to get the bills paid. And so we will. This episode, folks, is brought to you by Manscaped. Did you know one man? every hour, every day, is diagnosed with testicular cancer. In fact, testicular cancer is the most common form of cancer amongst men aged 15 to 35. So with April being National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, our friends over at Manscaped have partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to help spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection. And with this in mind, you can perform simple routine self-checks at home while enjoying Manscaped products you use every day, like the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. It makes sense, right? We use products daily to trim and maintain our boys down there. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra features two interchangeable skin-safe blade heads, as well as dual LED spotlights so you can achieve better visibility, making every trim more precise and hassle-free. If you don't like making a mess, well, guess what? This thing is waterproof. Shave in the shower, in the bath, or in the ocean. And you can bring this trimmer wherever you go, too, thanks to its wireless charging capabilities and travel lock feature. In addition to providing the right tools and solutions for comfortable and easy grooming, Manscaped is committed to raising awareness and giving support for fighters, survivors, and families impacted by testicular cancer. That's why they'll be donating $50,000 to the Testicular Cancer Society. So help save lives and balls by going over to manscaped.com slash TCS and sharing their funny educational check yourself video. And while you're at it, grab 20% off and free shipping with code OU Insider. Because like a famous American philosopher once said, take care of your mentals, your balls, and your chickens. There you go. Um, I actually... My... I know somebody very related to me um, that had testicular cancer. So uh, not not on my side, my wife's side, but um, yeah, it's a scary deal. Scary, scary deal. So if you can go do that, it's, it's funny and joke, ha ha ha. But the reality is, is that it's a serious conversation and a serious topic altogether. All right. Um, do we want to start? Well, I guess let's start with the the future cast, the crystal balls, and everything that went in with four star avalanche so, season, baby. Yeah, avalanche season has begun. Um, so here's the deal: Trent Wilson, four star out of the DMV, four star defensive tackle out of the DMV, mind you, one of the top two fifty players in the country. Where, where, what's his exact ranking? One twenty seven and number okay, seven so among he's defensive a top tackles. And he'll probably move up. He's a he's a he's a cat, is what he is. He's really really good. Um, OU missed out Landon Rink. Uh, well, whenever he announces, 
they will have missed out on Landon Ring. Uh, in, in our and he opinion. has announced. Okay, he announced. Okay. See, once he once we I realized that he was going to AM, you know, that just kind of went my 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 give a crap kind of went down. <laughs> that's just that's just how I roll. Like I, I stopped paying attention to a lot of those kids once they're not going to Oklahoma because it doesn't it's 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 wasting energy on me. So um yeah, so that's right. I did see he announced last week actually. A little, a little, a little, a little, last week actually. Um no, he announced this morning. It was like this morning, 45 okay. minutes ago. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. See, I thought it was last week. That's how much I see. I knew I saw it on Twitter, but I'm also in a daze today. Um, so anyways, Trent Wilson, this dude looked like Penn State was going to be really hard to beat, right? But Oklahoma was always trending right there with, with Penn State. Todd Bates had made him a very much focal point at defensive tackle, but it seemed like OU was looking better with Landon Rink for quite a bit of time. Particularly when we talked to Landon Rink, you and I did, and it was OU, OU, OU. Even Marshall Levinson, our this Midland region uh, analyst for Rivals, he talked to him. The very first impression he got was, it's Oklahoma. Well, Oklahoma offered a very favorable NIL package, uh, one that was probably – what I'm gonna say is OU does is not gonna overpay. That they're just not. They're not going to. And I'm not saying that AM did, but what I'm saying is is OU has their value of what you're worth. And if you don't want that, okay. We'll go on to somebody else. Well, they went on to this guy by the name of Trent Wilson of the DMV. And apparently they have pushed the gambit very, very hard there. And he will be in Norman, was it March 9th, I believe? Correct? That's the date he's visiting, correct? Did you, did you say March 9th? Oh, April 9th. I meant April 9th. You know what I meant. April 9th, right? So you were referring to... Trent Wilson. Okay. Trent Wilson was here on March 9th. He was he March already... 9th, but then he coming back on April 9th? Is that not true? I don't know. Or the or the that spring be... game. That would be news spring to me game. if he is coming okay. back on April 9th. He has a- not... spring game, April 20th, April 20th. Oh, okay. Well, there's a nugget. No, I'm hadn't... asking. I'm asking because oh. you've talked to him recently. I have not. He has not publicly disclosed any plans for future visits. Okay. There you go. That's why I asked. Um, I heard he may came, come back, but I, I'm asking you. Because <laughs> you would know more than me um, on that one. Uh, so anyways, he visited March 9th. Everything looked to go really well. Now things seem to be trending towards, I mean, how long do you think this lasts? I'll let you, I'll let you go further with that because I don't want to say too much. Well, I don't want to say too much either. Um, so. At this at this point, I would be surprised if he is not committed by OV season, or rather before OV season. There you go. Potentially much sooner. There you go. Well, see, I didn't I didn't want to say more than we are allotted to say. I talked to somebody yesterday. It's not, and here's the thing. I think everybody that follows recruiting kind of understands the game at this point, in that when you see that many predictions fly in all at the same time. Something happened, right? Yeah. Something yeah. happened, and it's no particular secret. And so it's not hard to follow the trail here. Oklahoma did have a very nice chunk of change set aside for Landon Rink. Landon Rink picks Texas A&M. Well, that nice chunk of change that they had set aside can immediately be reallocated elsewhere. Well, and from where I sat, Brandon, last plus what week, they was- already had for him, correct? Well, and I what I was thinking was, okay, because they offered Christian Evans last week, three-star out of Stone Ridge, Virginia. He's actually visiting yep. this weekend. And so I figured, okay, they're going to take what they had set aside for rink, and they're going to apply it in their pursuit of Christian Evans or maybe Floyd Bacard, the fast-rising defensive tackle out of the state of Florida that OU was in early on. But lo and behold, it – it would seem that at least some of the rink fund 
as it were, was immediately reallocated to the Trent Wilson fund. And credit to Todd Dillon, because like, you know what this reminds me of, Brandon? This reminds me of the whole Jaden Jackson saga mm-hmm. last year. Because And look, it's the Jaden Jackson saga turned within the last 72, maybe 96 hours in favor of Oklahoma. Like Ohio kinda, State, Texas, yeah. Miami. Oh, nope, nope, Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so it, like, it's not... It's not an exact comparison, but Trent Wilson has been to Penn State a zillion times, Brandon. Mm-hmm. He has been to Penn State so many times. He's been to did, Oklahoma once. Did he you go to their Penn. board to see? I have not been over there. They're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think they are. And look, like... He, it was a visit he was excited for. We did an interview with him before the visit over at OUinsider.com. He enjoyed the visit, had a great time. Obviously, OU made his top four. But the fact that things seemingly shifted here on a dime the way that they did, where you wake up one morning and boom, six, seven different predictions from all across the industry, including ours, for Trent Wilson. It's mm-hmm. not often that things change that rapidly with a defensive lineman of that caliber who has only visited Oklahoma one time. And in that sense, it is very similar to what Todd Bates in Oklahoma pulled off with Jaden Jackson. So it is. I know this is a little off topic because I vividly remember yesterday looking through the Penn State stuff. And just being utterly shocked about how many mentions of Lincoln Cure were on that board. And I know he recently visited there. I get that. But what the heck, man? Like, when did Penn State become like this player in that? In that and I, we'll get back to Trent Wilson because, but because that shocked me. Did that not shock you? Penn State. I mean, I get that they produce tight ends. I get that. But I thought it was going to be K-State, OU, I guess USC, and here's the other one that's been after him pretty hard, Oregon. I I thought that was a four. When when did Penn State become like this thing with him? They've been in the picture. He visited there in the fall. He's going to visit there. Now, as of right now, the top three for him – in no particular order, but actually it might be in this exact order, K-State, <laughs> Oregon, Texas A&M. Like, those are the three. Okay, And see, A&M has been kind of Johnny-come-lately in that one as well. I yes, mean, because they, they've of been... Colin Klein. Yeah. Well, that makes total sense. Because, yeah. you know, I, he, I always he... forget that he's at the OC there now. Anyway. And, he, and Lincoln Cure grew up watching Colin Klein, right? And so, like, that's... yeah. You know, there's a sense of reverence there. Oklahoma has started to fade. I'll just, I'll be completely honest. I don't know if they get him back on campus again. It feels like they kind of have to. Uh, if they want to make the final cut. But right now I'm, I'm not up. Man, here, here's what I think. And look, the, the OU staff knows infinitely more than I do about recruiting. And we know quite a bit, Brandon, but we're not... <laughs> We're not in the building doing this day in and day out. From where I sit, what I think the easiest thing would be for the future of Oklahoma's tight end room right now and the outcome of this 2025 cycle at the tight end position, go go press Chase Lofton. Go get Chase Lofton on board. Because I can tell you, after watching that guy, what, two, maybe three weeks ago up in Tulsa, alongside Nate Roberts and the son brain, he moves every bit as well as those two dudes. And he's not quite as physically developed. He's about 20 pounds behind brain and Roberts right now. But yeah. as far as motion route, running fluidity, athleticism, he is absolutely in that same class. And Oklahoma was his first offer. Joe John Finley was his first offer at camp last year. So from where I sit, I think it would make all the sense in the world just to go get Chase Lofton on board and then whoever wants it between Nate Roberts and Hassan Brame, let them jump on it. But like, 
what, what I don't want to happen is you continue to, I don't know, a slow play, I guess would be the proper term. You continue to slow play Lofton and then you're up a Creek without a paddle when you only go one for two with Roberts and brain. And then Lofton decides to go to Texas A&M or Nebraska or somewhere like that. And then you got to go further down the board for your second tight end. Yeah. I mean, that makes complete sense. So I guess the other um, topic of discussion that's been pretty hot is, well, okay, let's finish this Wilson thing up before I go there real quickly. Um, So with Wilson, the type of player that Oklahoma's getting, if you could give a comparison that OU fans would know and understand. Um, just kind of the, your average Oklahoma fan, not like uh die hard, die hard so that it makes even more sense. I guess who would you compare him to? You're talking about Lofton? No, or uh, I, Trent Wilson. Oh, Trent Wilson. Oh, we're back. Um, yeah, I just what I said, let's finish the Trent Wilson conversation. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, man. Like it's, it's hard to make that comp when a guy isn't as physically developed as he's going to be. Well, he's 275 right now. Yeah. He's 275. You would figure that by the time he is playing at Oklahoma, he's in that 290, 295 range and can push, can probably push 300 with his frame. Yeah. I'd shoot, man. I, <clears throat> He kind of reminds me of G.K. McCoy, by the way. Just his frame. Really? Yeah, his frame, how long his arms are. Like G.K. just had arms that yeah, went on he, forever. And he, you know who else? I think maybe this is a more recent comparison that you could glom onto is Perion Winfrey. Perion That's Winfrey a good another, one. Yeah, he had a, he, he was That's another a guy one. that obviously, like, he was very, very long for being a defensive but tackle. I don't think he's right going to be as developed as when <laughs> no 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 he won't be that's what i'm saying like, that's... <laughs> there's not very many people in this world that look like that guy yeah no. that guy walked right up now... the bus you're like god no that's their d tackle <laughs> that's when he knew that that was that 2020 and 2021 is when OU actually had an sec looking d, d line like they look like cat and they played like cats like they were really good could you imagine that d line by the way with venables bates and chavis and i guess zach alley now That'd have been, that'd have been something. That would have been something. It's a shame they just didn't decide to stay because I, I, I think Winfrey is a much higher draft pick. He's probably not in as much trouble now because, well, I take that back. That guy, I've heard stories. So moving on away from the Winfrey he's, stuff. Yeah, he's a little bit off. He's a character. Yeah. Uh-huh. Character. Yep. Yeah. But I think Isaiah Thomas gets drafted higher. Um, I think. I, it, as weird as it sounds, Benito gets drafted higher, and maybe even a first rounder. He he may, maybe he has twelve sacks instead of nine, right? Like or seven the final year. Like there, I think there's a there's just a difference in how they attack. So I just, anyways, I digress. But um, yeah, I, I like the GK McCoy, and I, I I want fans also understand. Like I'm not saying he's going to be the number five overall player in the country. When it's all said, that's not what I'm talking about. Frame and just actual like build and just playing style. You can be a playing style and still not have the same abilities as a Gerald McCoy because not very many people do. That's why he's going to be a Hall of Famer. So, I mean, there's a difference. And remember, GK McCoy took three years to become GK McCoy at Oklahoma. That's another thing. Um, by the way, OU is two for two now at Dr. Henry Weiss High School. If this if Trent Wilson How does in fact that? commit to OU. How about that? Jalil Farouk, number one. And we kept saying Jalil Farouk is a big play, big piece in this recruitment. Like he there is a reason why he did not leave with Caleb Williams. He loves, 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 loves the University of Oklahoma. And it's it's shown in a very big way with him. 
He's taken the criticism, but his love for his teammates in the university showed through all that, and he's helped recruit mm-hmm. several, several players to the University of Oklahoma. Um, he was a Dion Burks. He helped with Dion Burks quite a bit. I mean, that that he he you and I know Jalil fairly well. Mm-hmm. His personality is very, very it's like a it's a very magnetic. Was that is that is that a good way to put it? Just who he is as a person. Yeah, I mean yeah, I think that's fair. It, it, you you love him. And he, the second you meet him, you love the dude like instant. Yeah. Like he's just that guy. He's he's one of those guys that just has and I don't know, maybe there's a better word than magnetic, but he's an easy guy to feel comfortable around. Yep. And he's helped OU the last three years with several big recruitments. So, I mean, like, it, it, as much as OU fans, you guys want to dog on the the fumbles and a couple of the drops, he's actually been a really good receiver for the University of Oklahoma and made some massive – I mean, you don't win OU Texas without Jalil Farouk. I'm just making that statement right there. He made some big, big plays for OU in that game, particularly on the last drive with Drake Stoops. So, um, there's that. and. His again, his love for the university just it helps. It helps to have that when you're you're bringing recruits on. I mean, and and to have a guy that because a lot of times upperclassmen don't help out, right? Like they have the freshmen and sophomores be the the hosts. Well, Jalil has continued doing that because he just enjoys helping and recruiting, which. I think at the end of the day, he might be a good coach when it's all said and done because he's so good at it, at that. So that could be an interesting thing when it's all said and, when his NFL career is done. Because I do think he'll make a team. I think he's good enough to make a team, or at least a or a UFL team. I mean, one of those two. Um, I is Oklahoma hot by the end of, let's say, by the middle of May. How many commits do they have between now and then? Ooh. If I said the if I said like we know of a couple two right couple so um, by, by the middle of May you want to say <laughs> you want to say four more I was going to set the set it at three and a half three and a half plus the no I was going to set the line total three and a half total three and a half okay so that would get you to over under a total of 13.5 commits yeah 13.5 or 14 whatever. i'll take yeah. the over i'll be the optimist i'll take the over i actually agree with you because i think the the spring game is going to be a big spring board for yeah. the university i mean it was last year but think intended. about it zion kearney locked in at the spring game Jaden mm-hmm. hardy committed mm-hmm. at the spring game isaiah autry that one happened fast fast mm-hmm. that actually happened for commit yeah, mm-hmm. before the spring game, mm-hmm. uh, the day before, and then I think it was the day before, and then the next day he shows up and he's freshly committed. But yeah, if the spring game is anything like last year, I figure that's the uh, that's the swing for at least a couple of guys. So, and what we know, what's going on, trending behind the scenes, top five class. It's going to be hard not to, man. Well, my question is, do you have, do you have the top end star power in the class? Do you see that's where I, that's where I think. Yeah. Um, How many five stars do they get? I I say two. I think it's probably a good number. I'm gonna say I, I, I'm not I'm not as sold on Jonah Williams as I once was, and it's not that he's not trending towards Oklahoma. It's that as weird as this sounds, in a world where Marcus Wimberly and a Marion Robinson commit to the University of Oklahoma, I think Oklahoma gives the deuces. That's my opinion. To a five star. How many How many safeties do they can they have? They've I got would, like seven right now. They, I would they, say you can always have that number plus Jonah Williams. You you can, 
but will they? And are they going to want to pay that price to make that happen with the two guys that they already have on board? I, I mean, my answer is yes. <laughs> like I understand what your answer is, and I would probably say the same thing, but I'm we're not coaches. I'm telling you what I've heard, and that is if – he gets down to it later on down the line. Now, I think they're going to take him, obviously. You're going to always take Jonah Williams at the end of the day, but you're going to scare off one of those two. You would. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Like, I'm not – this isn't uh, – like, the that that latter part. I I think Oklahoma feels really good about Marion Robinson and Marcus Wimberly, as they should. Wimberly will be visiting again – When's his visit, Parker? You know the date. It's that's this weekend, uh, April sixth. This weekend, yeah, right, yeah. Um, and I will not be shocked. Will not be shocked if he comes out of that and Oklahoma presses for him. They are starting to fall in love with everything about that kid, from my understanding. They already loved him, but I mean, they starting to like, you know, there's always those. When you look at Jonah and you look at a Marion Robinson, right? And you see what they are. Wimberly is that plus he could grow into a backer. Like he can grow into a cheetah. Like he can grow into multiple things because of his size, right? Like he's like, and, and running a four, four. Are you kidding me? Like he has quickly become a guy that Oklahoma is looking at and going, okay, let's rock, you know, like let's do this. And I think it's a smart move because how much is Jonah going to be offered by A&M, Texas, Ohio State? You know, like, yeah, Jonah's favorite school is University of Oklahoma. But when the money actually gets put on the table, come closer to decision time, do they stay his favorite school? You know what I mean? There's risks when it comes to five stars, right? Always risks. And if you can get a talent like Marcus Wimberly, and you can go into Arkansas and steal the top two safeties out of that state, which coincidentally are two of the top 10 safeties in the country, by the way. Wouldn't you just do that and be happy and content? Like if you get those two and you miss out on Jonah Williams, are you pissed? No. I mean, I, you're not. Yes, yes. No, I think you, I think you still are like, not because those guys aren't both good players because they are, but because you led for so long for one of the top 15 players in the nation. I, get, all of a I sudden, get that, man. But, but here's, here's, here's what I don't want. Okay. Like <clears throat> if, if down the line, Jonah Williams wants to play bag games and, you know, continue to be, it sounds like that's what's but, happening right now. Cause he keeps trying to deflect away from Oklahoma. I mean, well, and that's what I'm saying. Like if he, if he wants to keep up this act that he's not leaning to Oklahoma and he wants to keep visiting everywhere, but Oklahoma, like I, I, I get it. I get it. If it is more on him than on you, that that's what I'm by talking all about. Means. But what I don't want to happen, what I don't think should happen is you end up voluntarily walking away. From no, the Jonah Williams recruitment. I'm talking about what you just alluded to, where he is playing so hard to get, where you're just like, okay, we're just going to go with these two, and we're going to go and be so happy with those two because, one, I think Amarian Robinson ends up being a top 75, 50 player in the country when it's all said and done. Don't you? Man, man can ball. He can. Now, let me let me make an analogy here. You remember how many safeties Oklahoma took in the 2023 class? They ended up taking four. Yeah, and they took three last 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 cycle. I don't know that correct. they can take three this time. But my point is... They have eight on scholarship. At, at, at what point is the... At what point is the fish worth the tussle, no matter how long it lasts? Because 
despite the fact that Oklahoma had a good solid safety room that they could be content with in the 2023 class, they still went all the way until signing day with Peyton Bowling. Yes, they did. So like for me, Jonah Williams is the type of guy where even if you feel good about your takes at safety and you have a couple of guys in potentially Amarin Robinson and Marcus Wimberly that you like and you're content, like you're cool with that being your class, that's fine. But I still think you go down to the wire as long as Jonah Williams wants to go for the potential of adding a guy like that to the room. Because I think in the long run, he's going to prove that he was worth it. And you know what? If it, it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I I don't think dealing with a one-over situation in the safety room is a bad thing if your one-over mm-hmm. is Jonah Williams. I think you're more than one-over, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, right. I mean, right now, sure. Like they're, they're over in a lot of ways right now. There's going yeah. to have to be a holding of the fold and we all understand this, but like that, again, this goes back to like, it's a cutthroat world right now in college. It is. And it's tough, There's- like, but you're building a culture. And I think that's something you have to understand too, from the coaching perspective, right? Like you have this culture and you have guys that fit this culture. You're also bringing in a guy that you feel like potentially bringing in a guy that you feel like is, going to fit the culture in Jonah Williams, but what if he comes in and the just kind of rocks the boat a little, you know what I mean? Like that there's a, and you could say that for every recruit and I totally get that. I totally understand that. But my, my point at the end of the day is that, I mean, how much stress does B-Hall want to go through again? Like that, that, that from talking to sources, I can tell you the Peyton Bowen fiasco was very hard on him, on the lie, on Bates, because they really put a lot of effort into that. Those three guys did and Venables. I mean, it, they took it rough when he didn't have the OU hat out there on the table at the end. I was told that was like a shot to the stomach to them. And it worked out at the end of the day because Peyton ended up choosing with his heart instead of with, you know, dollar signs in his eyes. But um, do you want to have to go through that again? You know what I mean? Like sometimes... Sometimes if you can get a two for one deal and a really, really, really good two for one deal, you'll, you'll take that and be content. And I, and, and I know fans are going to be bashing me in the comments for saying that because it's five star. You always want to get a five star, right? Again, I totally understand that. I'm throwing out caveats and trying to be a little level headed about the situation instead of, Ranking, 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 ranking. Because if a dude's going to be bag chasing, how many? How how often do the bag chasers end up fitting in with Oklahoma? They don't. David Stone took Buku's less to go to Oklahoma. Book, you and I both know the price tag he had. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you this: almost one and a half million less to go to Oklahoma. I'll just say it like straight up like that dude that it that but that that's the type of guy if you're going to get a five star that's the type of guy you want right you want a PJ you want a Jackson Arnold you want a Peyton Bowen that's going to choose heart over money right like that is do you not agree that those are the guys that fit what Venables in that team is about is that not a fact No, that is like, that's pretty undeniable. Okay. Well then if, again, like I said, if if he's going to be bag chasing and we're not saying he is, it just looks like he's trying to drive things up because he's now deflecting that. Oh, you no, 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 no. But yet behind the scenes, you continue to hear different. So like, it's just, I don't know. That's just my point on that. So it's just a weird deal. 
And you know, you'll get some fans will say it's it's not gonna be worth it. Just go get the two top four star guys and be content because they're gonna I think Wimberley, don't you think Wimberley will end up being a I think it'll be top two twenty five probably by the end of the cycle, sure. don't you? I can see that happening. Yeah. yeah. Um I mean, and you can get a top one hundred guy and a top two twenty five guy to be your two safeties. That I think that's a good that's a good haul once again by Brandon Hall. Pun intended. Um all right. Uh let's let's dive into some visitors this week. Yeah, this weekend. Go for uh, it. The Heisman Hangout is the name of the recruiting event this weekend for Oklahoma. And we got the full visitor list uh over at OUinsider.com for subscribers. So get on over there. But obviously Wimberley is gonna be in town. We already mentioned that. Several others of note, Taj Overton, the four-star defensive lineman in the 2026 class from Owasso. He'll be in town. Anthony Agumaro, the three-star yeah, lineman does he, from Elgin. Does he commit this weekend? Uh, and I, I don't think he commits this weekend, no, because he has officials set this month and next month. He's committing on the 21st, so I don't think it's over well, this weekend. You but so you think he sticks to that? That's why I'm asking. Like you, you think yes, he's I going do to be think hard he on that. that? Okay, I do think he because some kids that. just show up and they just commit and get them over with. You know what I mean? That is true. May 21st is his grandfather's birthday, though, so they mm. that date has some significance to him. Fair uh, enough. Yeah, th- I yeah. think he does stick with that. A uh, couple others. A guy making his first ever visit to Oklahoma. Four star linebacker out of the state of Florida, Ty Jackson. That's a name to get to know. If you're a Sooner fan, uh, Kobe Sellers, the four-star cornerback out of Houston, Texas, Shadow Creek, he'll be in town. Was Ty Jackson there yesterday too? At the practice, I don't believe so, but I could be. That would be a long time to be in town. Yeah, well, there was a there was a maybe 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 it was Tyson. Jackson or something like there was a linebacker. I, I just thought that I saw him yesterday. So I, I, I was trying to pay attention to the practice and I kind of walked by and I saw, and I was like, Whoa, okay. Well, that, um, there was an O-line there yesterday, by the way, but we'll talk about that here in a second. Go ahead. Yeah. That O-lineman ended up picking up an offer as well, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, so there's there's your sneak peek at some of the visitors that are going to be on campus this weekend. Obviously, another one that we mentioned uh, was three-star 2025 defensive lineman Christian Evans from the state of Virginia, recent OU offer, a guy that likes the Sooners a lot. And I am counting 28 total visitors. So I think we mentioned six, maybe seven there. There are 28 of them, 28 mm. of them. And all but two or three are legit, like scholarship caliber guys at the University of Oklahoma. So head over to OUinsider.com, check out the full visitor list. Uh, It is, I mean, for a weekend that has not gotten a ton of publicity as a recruiting event, this is a pretty, pretty stout list. Blue chips, it really is the place in the 2025 class and the 2026 class, and a couple of big 27s as well. Yep. Um, so let's, by the way, Kevin Sperry, we're recording this on a Wednesday morning. Kevin Sperry about an hour ago just tweeted out his 2025. Every time some there's a commit that happens, mm-hmm. I think we all know what that is referring to. Um, anyways, that's a heck of a list, man. So let me ask you this. Does any commits come out of this? I I'm interested to see. I don't know if you brought up Kobe Sellers. I don't hear you say that. And I know he's going to be there. I'm interested in that one because it's gotten OU is trending mightily well for Kobe Sellers. And he continues to show up to OU. Anytime there is an event. He seems to be around, just kind of hanging around. Now, and at some point, you would think, considering he 
is close with one Tory Blaylock that this thing could end at some point soon. Here's what's interesting, though. Here's what's interesting, Brandon, is that the Sooners, yes, Kobe Sellers is coming to campus this weekend, but the Sooners are hosting four, count them, four 2025 cornerbacks this weekend, and none of them are named Tristan Haynes. And so that tells you, yes, I like Kobe Sellers to me is the odds on favorite to wind up in Oklahoma's class at that cornerback spot. But Jay Valai and Oklahoma, they're not, they're not putting all their eggs in the same basket by any stretch of the imagination. And that to me, just again, just looking through this visitor list, that's another thing that really stands out to me is that you have 2025 visitors at positions where you wouldn't expect Oklahoma would be hosting guys that aren't, I, I shouldn't say top targets because obviously oh, you wouldn't host anybody if they're not a top target at this point in the 2025 class. But um, we all kind of have our short lists as to the guys that we expect to be in Oklahoma's class at each individual position group. And there are guys that would, would not be the first among the first three or four names mentioned on that list in terms of likelihood that are showing up mm -hmm. to Oklahoma this weekend and numerous guys that have never visited Oklahoma before in the 2025 class. Yeah. What do you think about, so, so you're not of the impression that he gets this thing over with anytime soon. Sellers. That yeah. is. Yeah. I, that, star, that one to like he, folks in slash around the Switzer center have believed and strongly felt for months now that Kobe sellers was going to be a wrap by the spring game. And it's two and a half weeks till the spring game. So it needs to happen like soon then. Right. Yeah. yeah it, if that's going to so, happen, it's going to happen pretty quickly here. Um, look, I, I know he has official visits tentatively lined up, but it's, it's felt for a while as though this is one that could end at really any point. Okay. And I do, th I do think that like, this is the type of weekend where it, it would make sense as many times right. as that dude has been up to campus. If he were to just shut it down. The the other one is Jalen Law, twenty twenty six wide receiver, defensive back. That is, uh, he's a Texas X, like he's Texas legacy. Texas legacy, obviously. And but the dude keeps showing up to Norman. <laughs> it's gotten uh, it, there was a point in time where I was like, there's zero chance that Jalen Law is a sooner. Dude, he's been there three times in the last couple of months. Like what? It, <laughs> It's gotten, it's gotten almost to the point where you're like, okay, it's kind of like the land and rink situation where you're like, we might want to start giving some validity to this thing a little bit, right? Like it's, it, it feels like his parents are kind of leaving the door open for him to choose his own route, even though I believe both of his parents were athletes at Texas, if I'm remembering correctly. Is that correct? Yeah, I think mom was track and yes. dad was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting that he like this is his third trip in a matter of months to University of Oklahoma. And I think it's fifth or sixth time he's been to OU in the last 12. And I get it. He's from North Dallas. Right. Um, he's in Frisco now. But for the longest time, I believe. uh he was right outside Allen. Oh uh, crap! Where was he at before that, Parker? He was in Frisco. Lovejoy. He transferred. Huh? Is it Lovejoy? Lovejoy. Yeah, right, right outside Allen, Texas. Yep. Um. So now he's at uh, I think Frisco Panther, Panther or whatever Creek. it's called, Panther Creek. Yeah. So, um, it's still very much pro OU territory, like. That whole one highway 120, 20, 121 goes east and west across the DFW metro, right? And it kind of slices North Texas, North Dallas to the rest of Dallas, right? Everything north of 121, there's probably 4 million people there. And that is all majority Oklahoma fans. And so majority Oklahoma fans. Well, it's very, very pro you 
very, very pro. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I I do know what you're saying, but I just know so somebody's gonna somebody's go, gonna, oh not I all heard, of them are. I, I get Brandon that. Brandon Drum say so, there were two million Oklahoma fans on the north yeah. side of DFW. I bet you there's a million out of that. <laughs> I, I that, you think, think that's an exact? I don't think that's an exaggeration. A million Oklahoma fans? Yes, I do think that's an in the DFW area. In DFW, yes, I still think that's an exaggeration. Out of ten million people, uh huh. Okay. Not one out of every ten is an Oklahoma. Fan. Mm, maybe not. Maybe I'm over exaggerating a little bit. I just know that I see OU everywhere up there or down there. So, um, point being is, is that it's very pro OU down there. O- OU is very, very well represented in that er- area of Dallas. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess it doesn't shock me at the same time with lot, but at the same time with both parents being Texas alumni athletes like that's it is shocking you know like so is this another emmett jones coup where he's just so good on the trail that jalen lot is actually a legitimate target for ou i've been burned I know, by texas I, I, you love you some emmett jones Brandon. and so do i i've been burned so. by texas legacies too many times I know. See, that's where I'm at too. Like, I'm like, ah, but he keeps showing up. <laughs> he does. He does. And I, so, I think Oklahoma may even have offered him even before Texas did. So they did. Who knows, man, but those kids are tough pulls. As we found out once again this morning when Landon Rink committed not to Oklahoma, but to Texas A&M. Okay. There's a whole huge list, by the way, of this right this uh the heisman hangout is going to be on this weekend at oklahoma obviously they're probably going to be sk- uh, scrimmaging as well so that's going to be a really cool deal for the recruits to see ou do their thing on the field um on top of all of that if you want to see the full list of tons of elite elite talent that will be there go to ouinsider.com I'm pretty positive we are the only ones that have it. So um, if you want to check it out, check it out. Um, one more before we go. Dejon Gaines out of Tulsa Union. I'm a huge fan. I see him quite a bit out on the trail of 7-on-7. Seven seven. He was playing with Sooner 7 there for a long time. Uh, he's a good player. If OU offers him, I like their odds. And I think he is a really good player, by the way. I think he can ball. He is a DB out of Tulsa Union. I ro- Shocking, right? A defensive back out of Tulsa Union. Haven't seen that 20 times in the last decade, have we, at OU? They produce some defensive backs there, man, and some good ones. That so, um, Like the odds there if that offer does get extended to him. All right. Um, Real quickly, let's talk some hoops. Well, oh boy. Yeah, but before we do that, um, that gummit, um, Powell was offered yesterday. Just went blank on his first name. Logan Powell. Logan Powell. Yep. Logan Powell, offensive lineman, uh, was in town yesterday uh, trying to pull up his. His credentials here. He is in the 2025 offensive tackle out of Phoenix, Arizona. Brophy College. I love that Brophy. The Bros. He plays for the Bros. <laughs> the Brophy, Brophy College Prep. Uh 6'5, 285. He is a good looking dude. I I he walked by me multiple times yesterday at practice and I mean his frame and he's slender, man. Like for 285, like he's slender, but he's got real broad shoulders, real long arms, trunk, obviously, to be able to put long legs, put weight on. Like he is going to be a good 320 when it's all said and done. And I like this offer. Um, I have not talked to him yet. Uh Plan on doing that today so I can get an update on OU Insider. But yeah, he's 
He was a good looking kid, Parker. Really good looking kid. What what do you think of him? I haven't even watched the film yet, so I would okay. love to be able to give an Here, informed opinion. I cannot. Here's a better question. Is that offer not interesting being 2025? It is interesting. And I think it's indicative of one thing. Like Broderick the- Scholl hasn't even been offered. No. Out of Bigsby, just, which is weird. Oh, he's not that high on Broderick Scholl. I know. It's so weird. Well, and at this point, I think it's kind of too far gone also. Uh, he mm-hmm. likes Auburn. He likes Tech. He likes A&M. It's probably coming out yep. of those three schools. Yep. So it's crazy, man. One of the top OK Preps kids heading out of state. But he, I don't, I mean, he's only lived in Oklahoma for two years. So, I mean, it's not really that big a deal. Um, okay, let's talk basketball. Really? Mm. You want to go mm. there? Mm. We got to go there. Okay. I mean, I guess we could talk spring practice if we want to. Basically but that's a whole new of... rotation next year. That's what it amounts to. Luke Northweather and Sam Godwin are Is the that only four guys. years in a row, brand new rotation. Yep. Yep. Not ideal. No, like. Okay. You were Porter Moser's biggest fan coming into this. Got to hire Porter Moser, got to hire Porter Moser, got to hire Porter. And I'm not calling you out. I'm just saying. So this coming from you, I think that's why it's going to hold more weight. Yeah. At this point. In time. If you're Joe C. Do you not just wipe your hands clean and go, Kellen, let's go. And just see if he can't fix this. Because it's obviously not getting fixed because there is no culture. There is no stability because there's no culture. There's no culture because there's no stability. Mm Mm-hmm. You can't build a culture without stability. And that roster gets turned over and turned over and turned over. And he keeps wondering why nobody's buying into his culture and mindset. And it's because there's too much turnover. Everybody's brand new all the time. You can't do that. He's like Venables. Moser thrives when his culture is set in place. It has never been set in place at OU. No. And... Look, the the way I see it, and we had a very, very intricate discussion about this exact topic on the radio yesterday, and I'll just kind of rehash some of my key points. Look, I I still firmly believe Porter Moser is a good basketball coach. Yes. Like what, like what he got out of that team this year, a team that was projected to finish 12th out of 14 in the Big 12, was remarkable. They won 20 games any other year they're in the NCAA tournament. They just happened mm-hmm. to get gypped because – there were five bid thieves on the final weekend. NC State got and just hot. to rub salt in the wound. The one, like the the team that quite literally knocked them out of the field on Sunday, is now in the final four. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, what a what an unfortunate turn of events that was. But as I see it, I think this has got to be, uh, and I. Uh, it's tough even to hang it all in one year because I, I think for me, it's worth it to give Porter Moser your like, no, I don't think right now, if you're Josie, you're saying, Kellen, let's go, let's move on from Porter. No, no, no. I don't think you're doing that because you did just win 20 games. You should have made the NCAA tournament. And here's, what's crucial. I think, I think this is why for me, the jury's still out is because Porter Moser had a very, had a very fortuitous, pair of happenings if you will regarding the transfer portal and i'm not talking about the outbound guys i'm talking about the potential inbound guys in sean padula from virginia tech and kevin overton from drake yeah the key pieces that oklahoma is retaining from last year's rotation they're both front court guys sam godwin luke northweather you can say what you want about those guys but they played and played quite a bit for oklahoma last year right mm-hmm. so they're going to be in the rotation again next year. You have better retention in your front court than you do the back court. Padula and Overton are two guys where if you plug them into the back court, that's a tournament team in all likelihood in the SEC. I think you still got to add a front court piece or two, but if your back court 
it basically revolves around Sean Padula and Kevin Overton, and you get some contributions from Dayton Forsyth and from Jacob Cole and Caden Cooper. That's a good squad. And to me, mm. this this is where it's key. Porter's got to land those guys. They've got to play well. And they've got to give you reason to believe that what you have established is moving. Because I, I think both Padula and Overton, correct me if I'm wrong here, Brandon, but I believe both those guys only have one year of eligibility left. So it's it's a one and done for them if they do end I'm, up. I'm looking ball. right now, but by the way. I think that's the one thing. Overton has three seasons. He has three seasons? Yeah, he was only a freshman at Drake. Really? Yep. Oh, okay, I was dead wrong on that one. But, okay, so Overton. I believe he's from Norman North and actually is really close friends with uh, Porter Moser's son. Well, that helps. Um, mm -hmm. If you can land those guys and they play well next year and they can get you to the tournament, then I think the narrative is reversed in a big way because – Roster yeah. retention is going to be an issue for every coach in college basketball. And yes, Porter's going to deal with it. I think more so than a typical coach. That's just his. Yeah. Style. It's been more at OU. That's been the problem. It's been way more than everybody's like, well, this happens all over. College. No, it doesn't. Your whole roster doesn't leave every year on all, every college basketball program. It's happened at OU. Four years running, by the way. Four. Okay. So even so, I think if Porter Moser can get two Okies in his backcourt, and those are the guys that carry Oklahoma to a tournament berth in year one in the SEC, then that injects some new life into this program. And I think that's also going to help attendance because historically where public interest in Oklahoma basketball has been the highest is when the key players on the team, the key rotation pieces have been homegrown kids. And so if you get Padula, Padula and or you get Overton and you add that to a rotation that's also going to feature an Oki in Dayton Forsyth and an Oki in Sam Godwin and an Oki in Caden Cooper, I like that. Like, that's something that fans can get excited about. That's a product that fans can get excited about for more than one reason. And mm -hmm. here's my fear. And I, I have laid this out on various platforms for quite a while, but I'll reiterate it. My fear is that Porter Moser is not going to have the type of top-down investment in basketball from Oklahoma that he needs in order to succeed. And I do think that's what he needs. I Because I think he's going to need a new arena. He's going to need more NIL because his style is not that of a natural galvanizer. And if you don't have strong NIL backing and you don't have elite facilities and all that, like if you're at a deficiency in those capacities, mm -hmm. you have to be a guy that is the type of relationally galvanizing personality to be able to keep your roster together and keep a core guys together that are willing to play at a discount for their coach. And Porter Moses yeah. is a great coach, but that's not his style, right? That's just not how he's wired. That's not who he is. And so my fear is that the Porter Moser's philosophy is not going to align with Oklahoma's administrative investment into basketball. And so I'm going to give it one more year. I'm going to give it one more year before I make this judgment definitively. But – the way things are going right now, I think you can say objectively that what has gone on in Oklahoma over the last three years is not up to the Oklahoma standard. And I think yeah. you can say objectively the program is no better off right now than they were when Porter Moser got here. Yeah, I, I, No, I they were a fringe, fringe and say tournament team. I when think got everybody there. would admit that. Yeah. So let's give it one more year. But I think we're going to come to a point where – we realize that either Porter Moser needs a much greater investment into his sport from the Oklahoma administration, or Joe Castiglione is probably going to have to look for a new coach if they're not going to make that type of investment. Because I, I believe Porter Moser is the type of coach that will thrive in a true mid-major environment 
as he did at Loyola mm-hmm. Chicago, or he will thrive at a high end P four job with high end facilities and high end NIL backing. I think the yeah. situation at Oklahoma right now is not conducive to success for who he is and what he is as a coach. And again, that's, I, I don't think the problems right now are all on him. I don't think they're all on the OU administration. I think there is shared blame in both camps, but that's fair. my fear is that if things don't go just so in year four for Oklahoma and they don't get to the tournament and they, say they don't land Padula or Overton and things continue to scuffle this next season that we're going to have to effectively acknowledge that the marriage between OU and Porter Moser just isn't a good one. And it's not necessarily a knock on OU as a basketball program or a knock on Port. Like you can be a good coach and you can have a good program and the two don't always necessarily mesh. We've seen Mm -hmm. it before. Yeah. So Oh, you better hurry and make that decision because I, obviously I feel the best fit is Kellen Sampson. And some people are like, well, why does he have to have OU connections? Why does he have, what has Kellen done to prove? Well, he's proven to be arguably the best assistant head coach in the country over the last three or four years, right? Um, he's recruited at an elite level at Houston. He's helped rebuild a fledgling program when his dad arrived at Houston into what it is today. And I was talking to a source around Houston basketball program yesterday. And they said, and they're talking about Kelvin Sampson. They said, and I quote, chief doesn't have much time left. Cause they, it's nickname Kelvin Sampson nickname's chief. And, and I said, really? And he goes, yeah, everybody around here wants to win one for him before he walks off into the sunset and retires. And, He's kind of the coach and wait head coach and waiting right now. Kellen Sampson is at Houston. So if you want to go get him, it needs to happen within the next 12 months. Like that decision has to be made because I don't, I can't see him getting handed the reins at Houston and just walking away from a program like that. Brooklyn, even though he's an alum, grew up in Norman loves the university, wants to do all that for OU. I know for a fact, like, OU's Kellen's dream job at this juncture. Like, that is his dream job. That's where he wants to coach. That's all he knew. For the, the dude coached at OU after he played for multiple seasons because he wanted to be a coach there. And then his dad got back into college. His dad did not hire him outright. He made him go to, I believe, Appalachian State, and I want to say it was Stephen F. Austin and learn under two really productive coaches there, right? Uh, One of them has almost 600 wins in their career. And then he hired him as an assistant coach. So he made him work his way up. So I I just just think he had – they need to get it right. Moser needs to get it right this year. And if it doesn't happen, then time, time to go. I just, I, I think it's that that's just the reality. Four years is long enough to prove, right? That's, that's particularly at a program like Oklahoma that historically is one of the top 15, 20 basketball programs in college basketball. Like you, they deserve better than that, right? Like it's, it's just the reality. So, Fans deserve more, even though they don't show up for everything. When they're really good teams, Buddy Hield, all those, they were there. Like you, you, you have a good product. Those OU fans, they will show up. But the product hasn't been great. Therefore, they didn't show up. And they did show up quite a bit this year for big games, right? Houston, Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma State. What happened in those games? Took a big fat L at home, right? So Kind of stinks. Anyways. All right. That's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. Uh, if you're not a member of OU Insider, go over there. Nine ninety five a month. Look, the Heisman Hangout list. We've got deep, deep team notes, practice notes from viewings yesterday, 
throughout last week, all that all over on the inside VIP chat with me. Uh, I'll have some notes from this past weekend's Durant seven on seven, some visitors coming up here in the near, near future. I know that there's some big targets coming in on the 12th and the 20th that I will have notes up here pretty soon. And then obviously Parker and I will continue to follow uh, some news that could be potentially buzzing around. There's that, that Sperry little tweet could be more indifferent than what we originally thought Parker and I have been as we're podcasting, trying to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. there, texting other people and sources and all that. So we'll have all those notes up there on OU insider VIP. Um, basketball recruiting our guy Brody transfer portal he's had it covered <laughs> better than anybody I tell you over man, there on funny. I got a I got a message I got a DM today on Twitter from a publisher of another team site who said hey I was reading through y'all's forum that Brody guy yeah he's doing an amazing job with that basketball yeah, he's a dude threat. And he is. Holy smokes, man. Brody is on top of everything. Everything sooner. He beats everybody to the punch, man. It's crazy. Um, yeah, he's done a fantastic job. So if you want all that insider news, that's all you insider VIP. It's nine ninety five a month or a whole year. We'll get you all through the first season of SCC basketball and football. If you sign up right now, ninety nine ninety five will get you a whole year. I'm telling you, it's worth it. There's so much going on. There's so much topic of conversation. It's a busy, busy board. So go over to OU Insider VIP. Check us out. All right. Also, subscribe to this YouTube channel. More to come. And we're looking to add more down the road as well to this YouTube channel that I think you guys will like. So uh, stay tuned for that. If you want all the up-to-date OU Insider news, recruiting, softball, baseball, basketball, football, all of it's right here on this OU Insider uh, you may not get the VIP stuff all together, but you'll get a lot of information here if you want to just check this out and subscribe here. Make sure you're notified every time we post a video every single day, live also on Wednesday nights where you can come ask questions. We answer, we do a lot of talking. It's kind of an open forum for you guys to talk to us. So, uh, all right, that's going to do it for this version of the U Insider and the Advisor Seniors podcast. For Parker Thune, my name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed day.